training session, they are more than 1% less than their, does that make sense? Right? So they're greater than 1% less than their pre-exercise weight, they're not hydrating. And you didn't do a good job at keeping your athletes hydrated and they didn't do a good, good job of drinking enough. So, seems a little bit um, dogmatic, I guess, but remember that there are stories every year of, of outdoor athletes who die during the summer because of training and being dehydrated. Okay. It can lead to a heart attack, it can lead to a stroke, it can lead to overheating, which shuts down organs and function. All, right? all kinds of things can happen if we don't pay attention. And historically, right, we had to wait for people to die before it was okay to take a water break during training. Right? You guys might be too young to remember that, but talk to older people that you know that used to be football players or softball players or baseball players. Right? You weren't allowed to stop for a drink during training. You had to train for the whole session. Only wuzzies stop for a drink. Right? So we've got to get past that mindset to a point where you can stop and take a drink whenever you like. Or I am going to stop you every 25 minutes and we are going to have a two minute water break before we continue this training session or however you choose to organize it with your particular group of people, right? You can make them have a water break or you can give them free water breaks. Problem with free water breaks is they've got to be disciplined to take them. Right? So you've got to decide how are you going to deal with this so that you're not the one that's putting your athletes at risk. So using a scale, as long as the athletes understand that the reason for the scale is hydration, not weight, is a very, very good tool. Easy, quick. Right? Urine color. So teach your PE students, teach your clients, teach your athletes to pay attention to the color of the urine because that is a very good tool. It's amazing what you can tell when you go and use the bathroom. Right? Did I eat too much fat? What happens if I eat too much fat in one go? Sure fat. <laughs> <laughs> when you're using the bathroom? <coughs> eating lunch, no one's eating lunch, right? Feces will float. Oh, nice. If you have too much fat. So, you eat that whole pint of ice cream, it's okay because you only do it once a month or once every six weeks, but the next day floats up in the water, right? So it's a very useful tool because if it's floating five days in a row, I'm eating too much fat. I need to have a few days where I'm not having very much fat. Well, urine color is another one. Is it a little bit icky? Yeah, but you just have to kind of grit your teeth and turn your head around and take a look. For the girls, for the boys, they don't have to bother turning around. Right? They just, it's easier for them. They should pay even better attention. Okay. U hydration. So if I'm fully hydrated, urine should be light. The more dehydrated I am, the darker the color will be. Now, if you're taking certain supplements, that can skew the urine color. So particularly B vitamins, for example. If you're taking a B vitamin supplement, that will change the color. Um, if you um, drink immediately, which we should do, it's going to skew the results. So if you, you want to use this carefully. Right? There's all kinds of color charts if you're a coach or a PE teacher. Put the color chart up in your gym. Right? Tell them they're responsible for checking whether or not they're hydrated. Because ultimately you want them to perform at 
their bets. Right? A, you can't teach them skills, you can't tweak skills, you can't learn new skills if you're not performing well. B, they're going to get hurt if they're not paying attention and they're not focused because they're dehydrated. So it doesn't do you any good as the coach to say, oh, well, I don't have to get involved in this. It's, not, I don't, it's up to them to stay hydrated because your job is on the line, not theirs. Right? So if I'm using the body mass, okay, plus or minus 1% of my original body mass, is likely to be around here color wise but plus or minus one percent at the end of the training session I've done a good job keeping them hydrated one to three percent down means they're starting on their way three to five they're pretty bad more than five I've got a problem if they're using the color, we want to try and stay below this red line on this particular tongue. So we have to do is go into Google and type in urine chart, and there are <coughs> millions of different versions of this chart. Right, print one out, get it laminated, put it up on your gym wall. Okay, make them keep a log, however you want to do it. Okay? I want to know what color it was every day this week. Whatever, right? It's up to you. Okay, but you want to teach them to monitor themselves. It's a lot easier than you doing all the work monitoring them. Um, let's see. Oh, the other thing to pay attention to is once we start heading down here, our ratings of perceived exertion that in, in our book we've got the Borg scale, but there are other versions of our ratings of perceived exertion. Um, that table, your perception of how hard you're working goes up the more dehydrated you get. So for yourself, you could be doing a piece of work that you always do, but today it feels really hard, right? And you're like, okay, well, I know I ate enough carbohydrate last night. What else is going on? Could be hydration, right? If things are feeling hard work. Um, There are some athletes who will deliberately dehydrate. We mentioned earlier in the week uh, weight sports, right? jockeys, powerlifters, athletes who deliberately dehydrate. So you've got to keep an eye out. There's a lot of problems with um, high school wrestling and dehydration because it's uh, not an acceptable, but it's an accepted historical practice that wrestlers dehydrate in order to make weight. So that's, it's, it's not safe. Right. So, to answer Ben's question about too much water. Okay. Um, technical term for water intoxication is hyponatremia, right? Hypo, remember, always is, is too much, too little, hyper, um, too much, but it's hypo because what happens is you mess up the sodium. So, too much water. How do I have too much water? It's not really too much water, it's the impact on the sodium. So I see decreased sodium levels. So there's a lot of theories on why or how the mechanics of this problem occur. 
we do hear stories, typically it's endurance athletes, particularly cyclists who carry a bottle on their bike, where we see hyponatremia that has caused a death. Um, you don't see it very often in anaerobic athletes. So low blood sodium concentration, way below what we would typically expect sodium levels to be in the blood. And what happens when the sodium balance is wrong is it, um, the blood-brain barrier becomes imbalanced. So the amount of water that can cross out of the bloodstream into the brain tissue goes up. So the weight, when we looked at the electrolytes earlier on, we said that the job of the electrolytes was to maintain the water where we wanted it. Right? We want it in the blood and a little bit out in the tissues. What happens in this problem is because the sodium drops down, the water can cross out of the blood plasma and into the brain. So then we get swelling on the brain. First symptoms will be maybe some disorientation or some confusion. Um, they may start having seizures if the problem is not picked up and it can lead to a coma um, and sometimes people don't come out of those comas. Okay. Um, so I can cause the low blood sodium a couple of different ways. I can drink too much, which is actually quite hard because you have to drink a lot. Right? Um, My, my understanding, if I think about it logically, it would be hard to do this in our environment because the amount of water we would have to drink, I mean, it's difficult to drink enough to even stay hydrated, let alone drink too much here, right? I mean, I can't, if I go back here, I'm always hovering. I, I hardly ever get here and I'm pretty, good at making myself drink. It's, it's difficult here. So I don't think that it would be very easy to achieve this in this by drinking too much in this environment. I don't know. I'm just thinking through what I understand. Okay? The other way though that the problem can occur, because remember it's not we usually hear about it because someone drank too much water, but it's not the water that's the problem, it's the sodium, is excessive sweating. Right? So a lot of sodium loss because I'm sweating a lot can lead to the same imbalance and cause a problem. Okay? And um, let's see, if I'm on a low sodium diet, Right? So if I'm someone that doesn't salt the water that I boil my vegetables in, I don't put any salt on food, I eat my own, I don't buy packaged food, so if I'm not adding the salt, there isn't very much salt. Right? So if I'm someone that eats a very low sodium diet and then I sweat a lot, I could cause that. Most of us, even if we don't add salt, me, I am lick my finger, stick it in the salt pot and suck it type of person. I love salt, so I over-salt everything. Um, most of us, even if we don't add salt to our food, eat foods that are high in salt because of our culture. I mean, we just, you know, we buy hamburgers, we buy yogurts, we buy potato chips, right? There's a lot of salt in the stuff that we eat. So, again, quite difficult to do because most of us have so much salt, it's difficult to get to a point where you've lost that much. For some reason, there seems to be 
a lot of um, female cases over male cases. They don't know why. Um, and I'm interested, they actually have a new version, a new edition of this textbook for next semester. I'm interested to see if that piece of information is updated because I can't work out why women would have a problem over men. So when you look at uh, rehydration drinks, right, if they're specifically a rehydration drink, not an energy drink for the process, then they often have some sodium in there. It's not always enough. But as I say, in our culture, we add salt into the food that we eat. So most of us are going to be OK. It's a pretty rare, no, I mean, we don't hear about it very often. You do hear about dehydration all the time. Tennis players, football players, um, baseball, golf. And we're actually, because of the level of concentration and focus that you would need to be a good golfer, I suspect that although you might not see a drop in physical performance that you wouldn't have to be very dehydrated for it to affect your game. But you're not going to get hypernatremia in the golfer. <laughs> okay. So guidelines for maintaining. We want to maintain. We want to keep that weight. 1% plus or minus around our starting weight from training. We want to keep that urine color as pale as possible. So begin the activity in a eu-hydrated state. So don't be thirsty when you start training. Remember, thirst means it's too late. Right? If I'm thirsty, I'm already dehydrated. So don't wait until you're thirsty. Make sure that you go into training with plenty of fluids in you. Right? So done. That doesn't mean that two minutes before training starts, you drink a gallon of water because you're going to make yourself throw up. Right? It means that you have to practice good drinking habits during the day. Maintain your hydration during the activity. Don't be the PE teacher or the fitness coach or the personal trainer who says, you can't stop yet, keep going. They want to drink, let them have a drink. Rehydrate after the activity. So, everybody needs to stop and have a drink. Right? We finish cool down. We all stop and have a drink before you can go to the locker room and change. Or however you want to organize it. But make sure that everybody is trying to rehydrate after the exercise. Uh, drink temperature should be somewhere between 50 to 70 degrees. So cool, not cold. Depending which culture, if you are Chinese, the Chinese think that cold things are very bad for your digestion. Right? No ice cubes, no frozen <coughs> stuff. Okay. So, cool, it can be in the fridge. It should not have ice cubes in it. The whole American ice cube thing, bad plan. Try to ditch the ice cubes. Put your bucket of water in the fridge rather than add ice cubes to the tap water. Okay. Um, although here the water in the summer comes out so warm I guess it doesn't matter because the ice cubes melt straight away. But wherever you happen to live in the country. Okay. Have individual hydration plans. So what are their individual sweat rates? Okay. What activity are we doing today? Am I running outside in November or am I running outside in August? My hydration plan for November is not the same as my hydration plan for August. Okay. 
because when I go outside and run in November, it's going to be below freezing. And when I'm running in August, it's going to be 100 degrees. So the amount of fluid that I need is different. It's got to be flexible. Right? You've got to understand, what do I need at a particular point in time for a particular activity in a particular environment? All right? Is it windy today? If I'm going to go out and ride my bike and it's windy, I need more water than if it isn't windy. Because I'm going to get more dehydrated with the wind. Um, guidelines. No guidelines, guys, because they are a little bit different. ACSM and NATA have guidelines for hydration. They're not exactly the same. Okay? It's a guideline, not a rule. Basically, they both say, start hydrating, maintain hydration, rehydrate. Hydration. Okay. 